Well, without further ado, it is my great, great pleasure to invite back uh, Martin uh, Parker, who is the Professor in Organization Studies at the University of Bristol in the Management School there. Uh, we had him in January uh, to give a talk on life after COVID in terms of business, which was hugely entertaining, very thought-provoking. And uh, we have him back today on a, on a very similar, you know, related subject, which is all about uh, creating a different business school for a different sustainable uh, economy. And uh, it's, it's, you know, uh, Martin's written, written many books. I think his last lecture was on, on life after COVID, which is one of his books. He's also written another book, which is slightly different to the title of today's talk, which is Shut Down the Business School, which is slightly more direct, whereas actually what we're covering uh, today is going to be uh, uh, in terms of business schools, in terms of how they need to change, how they need to adapt and to be slightly more relevant uh, in the new economy. So uh, without further ado, Martin, over to you for what will be a very stimulating lecture. I hope so. Thank you very much indeed, Andreas, and uh, a pleasure to be uh, back again, although <laughs> since I'm in my shed again, I never get to see Bath, which is a bit of a shame. Um, I'll just, I'll, I'll speak for about 45 minutes or so, so we've got plenty of time for questions. Um, and I'm going to be doing a talk which is deliberately provocative in the hope that we can have uh, an interesting discussion afterwards. Um, one of the things I want to just start off with is just to uh, poke fun at one of the members of the audience, um, who is my ex-boss, Gordon Pearson. Uh, Gordon uh, was head of department at, uh, head of the management department at the University of Kiel when I joined uh, the University of Kiel in 1995. Um, and at that point, I was moving from a sociology department where I'd been a lecturer and done my PhD in sociology uh, to a school of management. And I was very, very anxious about what that might mean. Um, very worried that as a sociologist, as someone who, if you like, identified himself as being quite sort of left wing and critical and so on, that I was moving to the home of conservatism, to schools of business and management, which I very often identified as being places which were quite reactionary, neoliberal, oriented towards the market and so on. Um, I and Gordon, um, in the intervening 25 years or so, um, disagree about many things, but one of the things that we do not disagree about is the idea that schools of business and management should be places that provoke thought. And much of Gordon's writing and thinking has been precisely about that, around topics, around business ethics, and more lately, uh, quite a lot of very uh, critical work on uh, what gets taught within business schools. Uh, so Gordon was not only a great manager, but something of an inspiration to me. Having, <laughs> having, having teased him like that now, he can't ask me a nasty question, I'm hoping. Uh, and he can't answer either because he's muted and he's got his camera off, which is even more pleasurable. Right, let me start by uh, sharing my screen. Uh, tell me if you can see the screen now. Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Okay. And you can see it on presenter view? Yeah, that's okay. fine. That's great. Okay. So um, as Andreas noted, I, I, I've chosen not to use the um, shut down the business school title, although um, I will kind of be talking about why business schools need very, very radical change. Um, so uh, the, the, the title is intended not to scare the horses too much, uh, a different business school for a sustainable economy. And as I get towards the back end of the talk, I'll also be talking about this idea of uh, reforming, reformulating the business school as what I call a school for organization or a school for organizing, um, which as I'll explain um, as I'm going through, is a, a different way of thinking about what the purpose and role of schools of business and management are. So the one of the things I want to begin with, if my if this is going to move, sorry, wait one second. Sorry, my my powerpoints appear to have frozen. Let me just. Uh, you may want to unshare, Martin, and then share again and see. Whether yeah, I think I'll do that. Try this. Sorry about this, everyone. 
it's my uh, it's my elderly computer which really doesn't like uh, doesn't like moving very much be with you in a second Okay, can you see that? Yeah, that's fine. Except it doesn't seem to want to move. Mm, maybe, maybe. Oh, hang on. Perhaps I'll just, yeah, okay. It may, it may just be very slow. It's possible. After all, we are going all the way to Bath. There we go. OK, it's working now. That's fine. Right. So what I want to start off with is, is, is just commenting that that some of the things that I'm saying are actually very commonsensical. Uh, one of the um, uh, one of the things that's always entertained me, really, is, 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 is looking at the ways in which schools of business and management are portrayed within popular culture. Um, because it seems to me that much of the critique of the business school is kind of already there. Um, I remember um, many years ago now um, uh, working at home and um, a, a guy called Deck was uh, painting my house um, and Deck didn't know what I was doing. So he asked me what I was doing on my laptop and I told him I was an academic and I was working and he said, what department do you work in? And I said, the business school. And he, and he immediately went into a kind of rant about how stupid and dreadful business schools are and how they educate people to be, uh, to be selfish and greedy and all the rest of it. So there's a particular kind of stereotype, I think, about what the business school is and does, which is already out there and already is is in many ways extremely sceptical about the kind of things that business schools do. There's a sense in which my critique is no more than sort of borrowing this. There's a beautiful episode of Futurama, the Matt Groening uh, cartoon show, um, in which uh, Gunter, the educated monkey, has a picture of him here. Uh, Gunter is um, uh, no, it's stuck again. Good grief! Let's see if it's going to move. Sorry about this, everyone. My elderly computer really doesn't like moving. Maybe if you take it off uh, present mode and you just yeah. present it in the other. Yeah, I'll try and do that. That that did seem to work before, didn't it? Yeah, I think that's probably the, the best way forward. Mm. I mean, otherwise, I've got your presentation on my laptop and I could uh, do this presentation for you. Yeah, we could do that. But it'd uh, be nicer if I could move myself. I think the thing's just very slow. It's... Um... Yeah. OK, so the educated monkey, Gunter. Uh, is being uh, interrogated by the scientist Farnsworth. What about your super intelligence? And Gunter says, when I had that, there was too much pressure to use it. All I want out of life is to be a monkey of moderate intelligence who wears a suit. That's why I've decided to transfer to business school. No. And then we have a, a series of kind of business school type gags as well. Manage visiting some cannibals. Astonished to see this sign outside a restaurant. Today's specials, Brain of Engineer, $15. Brain of Architect, $20. Brain of MBA, $250. He says to one of the waiters, wow, an MBA's brain must be so delicious. The waiter replies, are you kidding? Do you know how many MBAs you need to kill just to get a little piece of brain? There's, uh, there's, there's, there's lots of these. If you, if you have, a, have a kind of Google for MBA jokes and you get stacks of these these sort of, um, uh, well, basically alternative acronyms for MBA, as well as lots of, lots of uses of the idea of the MBA or the business school as a place that produces either um, selfish evil or charlatans. So as in this mediocre but arrogant, management by accident, more bad advice, master bullshit artist, and so on. So you have this kind of, it's this sort of interesting paradox, really. The business school sells itself if you look at business school websites and textbooks and so on, the business school sells itself as the source of so much creativity and excitement and dynamism within the markets and promises a great deal to the students who go there. But within wider culture, I think the business school has a terribly bad reputation. I think it's seen to be a deeply problematic place. 
And in a sense, if you want to understand something about my talk, then I guess I'm kind of picking up on that cultural critique on trying to puncture some of the pretensions that business schools are selling, some of the claims that they're making, in order to understand what use we might be able to make of them um, in forging a different kind of economy that's gonna save us from global disaster. So for those of you who aren't necessarily uh, part of the, the sort of business school, uh, bus business school elephant, uh, let's just do a little bit of history to start off, because the history is kind of important in that it's very often suggested that the first business schools are American, but this simply isn't true. The, the first business schools really start to emerge um, in the kind of middle of the Industrial Revolution, um, and particularly in continental Europe, where they're very often associated with uh, the rise of a particular kind of managerial class, of a kind of technical professional class. Um, and schools of business and management often kind of grow initially teaching things like accounting um, as being part of the sort of um, uh, a, 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 almost like the kind of civic pride of a particular kind of city. Yeah, and, and often often associated with with industrial cities and with uh, associations of business people of various various kinds. So the, the first one here, the Ecole Supérieure de Commerce de Paris, is is effectively an accounting school, but one that's one that's kind of constructing itself increasingly as um, as a place which is actually quite curiously international. If you look at the history of the Ecole Supérieure, um, it's it's actually got a remarkably diverse student body. Uh, there's almost this sort of idea that the um, the, the the science, the, the the methods of business, are somehow um, um, cosmopolitan in ways that that, that, that that mean it wasn't simply a school for you know for, for Parisians. Um, I remember looking a couple of years ago now at the uh, at the people who were enrolled in some of the early classes and as I said you know there, there, there are a, whole, a wide variety of, of, of nationalities uh, being taught at these schools. So there's a long history in Europe of these schools associated with chambers of commerce and various other things but the important moment, I think, in the contemporary history of the business school is effectively when the North Americans get in on the act. So it's in the kind of the, the towards the back end of the 19th century from the 1870s onwards, that we start to see the rise of the big American business schools. But again, rather like um, the European ones, very often these are schools which are not, not really teaching um, technocratic ideas as such, but very often providing a certain sort of legitimacy for a new profession, a new managerial profession. And often in the early schools like Harvard and Wharton and Penn and others, there's a clear emphasis on a certain kind of um, moral training too. This idea that what you teach people when they go to these schools is how to take on certain sorts of civic responsibility, how to um, how to understand the role of the business within the context of the um, within the context of a growing and complicated society. So there, there's a, there's a sense in which the early business schools, or, or at least the curricula of the early business schools, is very much about a kind of moral rearmament in a way. You know, it's it's, it's trying to provide people with good reasons to feel proud about being involved in in business. Now. The intervening period is, um, so in between say the, the, the foundation of Harvard in the 1870s and a Wharton in the 1870s and, and onwards, is kind of important in the sense that it's basically a story of very rapid growth from something like the 1970s onwards. And it's really the 1970s onwards that marks the moment at which the business school effectively becomes a kind of instrument which, um, effectively becomes a kind of loudspeaker for neoliberal economics. Um, many of the histories of business schools mark this moment as, as the point at which the business school was effectively taken over by finance as a discipline, where ideas about uh, shareholder value, uh, for example, um, really bec become dominant as, as, um, as a way of thinking about what the business organisation is. So um, for many of these historians, there's a kind of decisive change around about the sort of, you know, Thatcher, Reagan, Friedman sort of time when the business school becomes 
loses its sort of moral um, foundation um, and effectively becomes an instrument for talking about markets. Now, the business school complex is gigantic. Um, there are a huge number of business schools globally. Um, this, this number, I've been trying to source a, a better number, but this is the best one I have at the moment. So 2011, an estimate that there were something like 13,000 business schools in the world, lots and lots in India, um, uh, not just the big state ones, but lots of lots of, of small private ones. But, but effectively, you know, the business school is now an ubiquitous global phenomenon. Every large city uh, has its business school and, you know, something like an opera house or a football stadium or something like that. You know, business schools are a kind of an expected part of the landscape of higher education globally. Um, and they're also enormously profitable. So um, London Business School currently advertising a tuition fee of 78 and a half for its MBA, 78 and a half thousand pounds for an MBA. Uh, that's just the fee. That's nothing to do with living expenses or you know, any of that kind of stuff. Um, which means that if you do, you know, do a bit of crude maths on this, this means business schools globally in 2011 probably had a fee income of something like $400 billion. That's just the fees. So we're not talking about, you know, the textbooks or uh, the, the consultants uh, or the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the gowns and the, and, and the waterboards and all the rest of it. That's just the fees that are being paid to business schools by students, by grateful students who are getting an education in business. Now, that's kind of interesting to me because I'm interested in the history of higher education. And I don't think we've seen in the history of higher, the 800 year history of higher education, the development of such a powerful discipline um, really since, since medieval times when effectively um, you know, the ancient European universities were dominated by the church. Something like, um, I think that the figures from UNESCO were something like one in five students globally are now studying some version of business and management. Um, and in some territories that goes up to one in four. I, I did hear a, 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 an account, I can't actually source this, that in Australia, one in three students are studying versions of business and management. That sounds like a bit high to me, but we can be pretty confident that about 25% of students globally are studying business and management. So the dominance of this discipline, of this institution is astonishing. Um, and it's effectively happened in the last 50 years. It's, uh, it's a kind of quiet takeover of uh, um, of, of one particular part of the university. So what do business schools actually do for those people who haven't been to one? This is a picture of London Business School, which uh, would like to be presenting itself as the, uh, as the most, as the kind of the key business school in the UK. It's part of a kind of global, um, uh, a kind of global network of premium schools, usually in the key cities um, across the global north. Um, and these are places that charge very high fees that have quite homogeneous curricula, quite similar curricula, whether you go to uh, Harvard, Wharton, Paris um, or London. Um, but I think one of the things that they're certainly doing is producing a particular idea about who the business person is and the kind of language that they use. It's interesting if you look at the, uh, some of the sort of the marketing that London Business School claims about itself. It's very much an appeal to the customer, yeah? Uh, drive your career forward and achieve your goals in an inspiring learning environment. Um, this is the kind of, uh, you, you can see this echoed in so many other business school pitches that effectively it's a bit like the business school is saying to the aspirant student, come and study with us and you will you know, double your salary, you'll become an important person, the kind of person who uses first class lounges and airports and stays in posh hotels and all the rest of it. Very much an appeal to the individual. When I was at, um, uh, at Warwick uh, Business School for a couple of years, which again would be an example of one of these quite corporate uh, schools, um, their pitch at that time was about investing in yourself. So rather than thinking about education um, as some form of self-development or exploring particular sorts of ideas, it was explicitly pitched as, you know, you, you're invested by doing your MBA at Warwick, you're investing in, you know, Project Me um, in order that you can get more money, do something more exciting, whatever it might be, that sort of idea. 
So the student is being figured as um, a particular kind of individual who, um, with the cultivation, with the uh, accreditation provided by this school, will be able to maximise their uh, their personal benefit. Now, these schools, um, in terms of what they teach, as I suggested, I think are remarkably homogeneous. This is the slide that um, in my talk that annoys anybody who works in a business school. Um, so I'm going to do it unapologetically. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can shout at me afterwards. Um, I guess one of the things I should say is that here I'm talking about what 95% of business schools do 95% of the time. There are exceptions. You know, there are particular schools that are teaching different kinds of things or using different sorts of methods or are committed to different sorts of values. But most of the time in most schools, I think they can be, the, the curriculum can be boiled down to three lessons. So first of all, there is um, a real dominance of thinking about the corporation as being the most important and sometimes effectively almost the only form of organisation that really matters. Um, anything that isn't a corporation is very often imagined to, be, to, be, to want to become a corporation. So, you know, when you're talking about startups or SMEs or growth trajectory or whatever it might be, the kind of assumption is that the end of that is that either the organization becomes a corporation or that it gets bought by a corporation. You know, that's the, sort of the idea of the unicorn. So. Now, the dominance of the corporation effectively means that in case studies and in teaching and so on, that this is a form of organizing which is presented as if it is the solution to all sorts of problems. It's, it's suggested that it's the most innovative, the most effective, the most efficient, and so on. It's the kind of um, the uh, the sort of the ultimate form of evolution of the corp of, of the organisation is the corporate form, and that embeds a particular conception of shareholder value too. Obviously, because you know one of the things that we can say about corporations is that effectively they are machines that are designed. Um, in certain cases, certain jurisdictions legally to, to enforce the idea that shareholder value is the only form of value that really matters. Other forms of value, you know, the environment or people or whatever else might be paid lip service to, but the bottom line, that metaphor is important, the bottom line is shareholder value, because if you can maintain your share dividends, then you're a successful organization. So, the dominance of this, this sort of model, the model of the corporation, effectively means that shareholder value is conceptualized as the most important form of value, the dominant one. Secondly, growth is imagined to be the ultimate goal of any business activity. So big is seen to be beautiful. This is a kind of an echo of the, 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 the lauding of corporations, of course, and this sort of idea that um, if you are, um, if you're trying to assess the um, importance, the, um, uh, the, the, the success of any particular organization, then looking at its number of employees, the number of territories it operates in, the amount of profit it makes, whatever it might be, are all based on this idea of, of, of an upward growth, to, growth curve. You know, the, the idea of, of, of that sort of, of that curve is, is central to thinking about strategy in general. Um, there are a variety of things I'll say about this a bit later, but it effectively embeds this notion that acquisition and growth and aggressive marketing and all the rest of it is the only way in which you can conduct business practice. Um, and really uh, means that uh, steady state forms of business practice, that's to say businesses that might be satisfying customers or producing, you know, good uh, good products or just working within one particular area one city or something like that are imagined to be unsuccessful because they don't meet the criteria of growth and then thirdly i think that business schools embed the idea of management both as a a particular group of people but also a certain kind of skill as a, an inevitable feature of any successful organization 
what this does is, is, is to say that hierarchical organizational forms are necessary and inevitable, that any organization requires a trained cadre of managers, of organizers, who are at the top of the organization, who are paid more because of the responsibilities that they hold, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that places, places us in a position where we assume that ordinary people can't manage themselves. It's a profoundly anti-democratic notion, of course, but it's one that effectively is canonical within most business schools. After all, you know, if they're not teaching the cadre of managers, then what are they doing? You know, how, why, why are they charging so much if, um, if, if they're not going to be claiming that management isn't absolutely necessary? So that, that effectively rules out the possibility of a whole series of more democratic, more consensual, more lateral, more distributed ways of thinking about how you uh, lead and control uh, any particular form of organization. So now hopefully some of you will be fuming by now uh, since I've uh, insulted all business schools everywhere. But bear with me for a bit because what I want to say is that even if this is a characterization that holds for the majority of business schools the majority of the time, it is still a profound condemnation of what business schools are doing, because effectively what it tells us is what business schools are really doing are teaching the standard model of capitalism. You know, those people who benefit from it, either like me as you know, an employee or the students who are going there and expecting a bump in their wages or whatever it might be, are benefiting from or want to benefit from the standard model of capitalism. And that's a model which I believe has very profound problems. But I, it's not just me believing it, and I think all we need to do is look at the weather uh, and then we can probably agree that there are problems with the way that capitalism is currently conceived. So what's wrong with capitalism? Let me just do this in four pious and annoying slides. Well, first of all, Capitalism as a global system uh, is, not, um, uh, is not causing any particular trickle down right now. Indeed, it's embedding gigantic forms of inequality. Um, this, this is a pre-COVID slide from an Oxfam report. 62 people own the same wealth as the poorest, 3.6 billion. Uh, that has actually, as many of you will know, uh, got much worse during COVID, largely because the um, personal worth of a lot of the dot-com uh, billionaires has increased very substantially indeed. Uh, Jeff Bezos now, I think, the Amazon uh, guy, I think is probably the richest person who has ever lived ever on the planet, richer even than the pharaohs or Louis the, Louis the 16th. Um, you know, his personal fortune is now um, in, I can't remember what it was last time I looked, it was sort of you know, 30 billion or some, 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 some crazy amount of money. Um, and those kinds of inequalities are effectively lauded within capitalism. That's the, you know, one of, one of the ways in which we measure success is the growth of, uh, uh, the growth of income of some of these, uh, these, these uh, crazy, particularly dot-com dot uh, entrepreneurs. Secondly, capitalism is real, resulting in a certain sort of corporate hegemony. If you look at virtually every market segment now, this is a, um, a diagram for food, what you can see is a smaller and smaller number of companies dominating um, uh, virtually every area, whether that's you know, digital stuff or food stuff or media communications, whatever it might be. Effectively, what you're seeing is a process of concentration in which smaller firms are simply bought out by bigger firms. I think talking to somebody about, um, about entertainment and I think, is it, is it right now, some, something like 80% 80, 80 of content is uh, controlled or streamed or funded by about four different organizations, something like that, um, which again, is an astonishing degree of concentration. This is back to kind of, you know, the Hollywood moguls, if you like, in, in terms of the, uh, um, uh, the anti-democratic ways in which we might talk about uh, corporate dominion. Thirdly, capitalism is producing externalities. Capitalism as a routine matter treats the planet as a resource, uh, a resource sink and well. So it, it, it extracts materials, whether you know, those are uh, the, the, mobile, the, 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 the raw materials to make mobile phones or whatever it is. And then it, it, it usually uses the environment as, a, as its tip and expects that, um, that the state or various arms of the state 
will uh, will will deal with the externalities that therefore thereby produced. That's one of the features of you know the corporate form again. You know the corporate form is extremely good at producing um, a barrier between its responsibilities and its externalities, whatever they might be. These kinds of externalities are producing the sorts of um, 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 crises, many of the crises that we're seeing in terms of de species decline and various other things. And then finally, of course, uh, we could talk about climate change. Um, easy enough to do this with a kind of mawkish picture of the last polar bear dying on the last shrinking iceberg and so on. But nobody now can seriously deny that climate change is happening. Uh, despite uh, decades of obfuscation by uh, large corporations and nobody can deny that business plays an absolutely central role in producing carbon. Um, the activities of car manufacturers, of, uh, of, of people who grow food, of um, airlines and so on, are, are what's producing the carbon in the first place. So it is clear that business needs to change and business needs to change absolutely radically in order to prevent a species threatening crisis. So if this is the case then, if business schools are teaching capitalism and capitalism is producing these kinds of problems, then it seems fair enough to me at any rate to ask whether or not business schools are actually engaged in education or some form of ideology, whether they're re effectively, um, that we shouldn't really treat them as if they were like schools or like universities. They are simply reproducing a particular kind of dogma. And, you know, my, my, my sense is that this is a profoundly dangerous dogma. I'm not saying they're the, the only cause of it, but the idea that 13,000 business schools in the world are reproducing a particular set of ideas about growth, about corporations uh, and about management uh, seems to me profoundly dangerous at a point when we really do need to think about alternative economic models. Now, what do we do about this then? So this is the kind of the hinge in the talk. And I, I guess it's the point at which I get quite critical of um, academics themselves. I've been um, teaching uh, in uh, business schools now, um, well, since I met Gordon Pearson uh, 20, 27 years ago. Um, and I'm part of this thing called critical management studies. Critical management studies is a sort of a loose grouping of uh, people very often who did their training in other areas like me in sociology um, and ended up working in the expanding business schools of the 1990s. And people who've engaged in critical management studies have very often um, been writing a lot about the problems with the business school, with the forms of research and teaching and the ideas and all the rest of it. Um, in a couple of different ways. I mean, one of them is clearly to think about questions of business ethics, corporate social responsibility, sustainability purpose, and those kinds of ideas. Many academics are writing in these kinds of areas, usually um, not proposing any particularly radical changes, but normally suggesting that if businesses behaved better, then somehow uh, we could stave off the possibility of crisis and collapse. Critical management studies has been in a slightly different position in that it's very often used a set of more um, theoretically and politically challenging resources like feminism, anarchism, um, various kinds of post-colonial ideas, socialism, queer theory, and so on, in order to uh, publish a great deal of unintelligible critical work that nobody ever reads. And that's really, you know, my main criticism of critical management studies. There's a sense in which it just it has engaged in a war of the pen. Um, it's effectively uh, uh, used the business school. People like me have used the business school as a, um, uh, a, a splendid place to spend time biting the hand that feeds them. Or in my case, gnawing obsessively at that hand and paradoxically being rewarded for doing it without actually making any difference on the, uh, on the strategies of those schools. Business schools continue to grow. They continue to teach largely the same kinds of things. And in a sense, the fact that people like me can carry on publishing 
uh, so you know, as, as as Andreas mentioned, my last book was called "Shut Down the No." Well, a couple of books ago, called uh, "Shut Down the Business School," um, and with that on my CV, I was given a job at the University of Bristol. Is not, I don't think, particularly an indicator of the tolerance of the University of Bristol. I think it's more more a question of the irrelevance of the critique. If the critique actually mattered, if it meant something, then they wouldn't have given me a job. Um, but as it is, <laughs> you know, I think I could write a book about pretty much anything and that wouldn't really matter. So the war of the pen, it seems to me, doesn't make any difference. The war of the pen hasn't hasn't achieved anything in the last 25 or 30 years. It's, it's not it's not changed the way that these schools actually operate in practice. But of course, nonetheless, all of the people I'm talking about and many others engage in a whole variety of forms of political action of various kinds. And many of them would be people who are worried about climate change or about inequality or about food miles or whatever it might be. So many of the people um, I know and the people on this call will be active in a variety of ways, thinking about how to, um, how to orient their purchasing or their ideas towards changing the global economy. Even something as simple as, say, buying uh, some fair trade coffee. You know, that's a way of trying to intervene in um, the constitution of global supply chains. Often when I'm teaching my students about these kinds of things, and you know, it's sort of important to me to, to take even relatively small choices, like, for example, fair trade, and to expand those out into a way of thinking about system change, about how we might imagine different conceptions of what a global economy might look like. So I think people, in, in, a, in a sense, one of the paradoxes with this is that what happens, you know, as, as what I've been, do, been doing as an academic inside my various business schools that I've worked in has been kind of less relevant and important than the various things that I've been doing outside, like buying fair trade or being a member of a political party or a, or a social movement or a co-op or whatever else. All of those things seem to me to be examples of organizing, which is practically trying to produce a different kind of world. It might be odd to hear a, an academic claiming that what, uh, what he does outside academic work is actually more important than the academic work itself. So organizing is my kind of central concept here, really. And it seems to me that we need to, 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 to rethink what business schools do in terms of ideas about organizing. Organizing, um, as this quote from Hartin Negri, the uh, sort of Marxist political, political economist suggests, that effectively resistance to a whole series of um, regimes and economic, uh, economic ideas which were seen to be unjust has involved organizing, has been a kind of school for organizing. That's to say that when you construct an alternative to a present, you're necessarily thinking about ways in which those alternatives might be figured, they might be imagined. Um, as this lovely short quote from Joe Hill, the labor organizer, don't mourn, organize. In other words, if you want to change the world, do something. You know, don't, just, don't just be sad about it. And from my point of view, don't just write a pointless article that nobody reads. Organize something, do something. So the question it seems to me for how we imagine the alternative business school is really to get away from this idea that the proper object of interest of the business school is management. I think the object of interest of the business school should be organizing, which I define very loosely as how people and things come together to do stuff. Okay, how do we, how do we put our, how do we as human beings put our worlds together? And one of the things that we can be very clear about, you know, we know this in terms of um, our understandings of history and geography and anthropology and so on, is that human beings have organized their worlds in very, very different ways. We, we are uh, not the cleverest people who've ever lived. And we shouldn't imagine that everybody, uh, everybody who's not us is somehow, um, uh, is, is somehow lacking a particular form of expertise or knowledge. So it seems to me that looking at different forms of organizing allows us, gives us a lens to start to think about how we might teach and think about an alternative economy. 
So organizing and defining here, again, relatively loosely, as the proper part or object of inquiry of that part of university, which is concerned with patterns of exchange relationships, the production of value, the generation of organizations. And it seems to me that that's a more robust way of thinking about what business schools should be doing, rather than assuming that their mission is to reproduce a particular form of late capitalist organizing. Now, I'll come back to that in a minute, but just before I just before I do that, let me just use another concept here. In the 1960s, 1970s, uh, a bunch of educational sociologists used to use this concept of the hidden curriculum. Um, and it was usually aimed at, um, say, uh, say, say uh, girls in, in school or, 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 uh, or black kids in, in white schools. And the idea was to focus on what didn't get taught as much as what did. So if a young girl didn't see any female scientists, she would just kind of assume that women didn't become scientists. Or if, or if a black kid didn't see any you know, cultural producers, any artists or musicians who were black, then they would just assume that you, know, you had to be white to do this kind of stuff. The hidden curriculum is effectively a way of not teaching about something which reinforces the dominance of a particular uh, hegemonic idea about whatever that, that that particular apparatus is. So what's the hidden curriculum of the business school then? Well, it seems to me that the hidden curriculum of the business school is very often precisely those alternative forms of organisation, which very rarely get mentioned in the dominant curriculum, even something as important as, say, the cooperative form. To tell you a little story, I have a, a friend called Chris Budd, uh, Chris, um, some of you may know him, Chris um, ran a company called Ovation Finance based in Queen Square in Bristol until about five years ago. He then sold that into an employee ownership trust, so like a kind of mini John Lewis, um, and it's doing very well. Um, uh, Chris basically got a series of, of kind of staged payments to be bought out of it um, by the employees of the organisation. There are quite a lot of employee ownership trusts in Bristol, probably the most famous one is Ardman which was sold into an employee ownership trust about two and a half years ago now, something like that, and is, you know, is, is a perfectly successful and sensible organisation. Now, Chris's um, uh, daughter, I think it was, wanted to go to um, Edinburgh to study business. Um, and so Chris took her to the open day and the poor sap who was sitting on the desk uh, had uh, Chris Budd asking him, do you teach about employee ownership? A fairly uncontentious question, you might think, given that there are plenty of business models which are based on employee ownership. The person said, I don't think so. No, you know, we teach about management. <laughs> and Chris was furious, absolutely furious. And he was so angry that he wanted to find somebody to shout at. And so he found me on the web and we agreed that it was ridiculous. And we talked a lot about these kinds of things ever since. The point is that most schools, most of the time, don't teach about this kind of stuff. They don't even offer courses on co-ops. And, you know, a co-op is not an unconventional business form. It's just a way of describing an organisation which is owned by its workers. So the hidden curriculum of the business school is effectively anything that doesn't fit in to that dominant model of you know, corporate managerial pro-growth stuff. Anything which is aimed at uh, a more democratic workplace, a, a low carbon workplace, um, some kind of a localised business strategy and so on, doesn't really get taught within the context of the business school. Now this is really odd, you know, it's, it's ridiculous in the sense that when we establish a discipline within an institution, we expect that it will be relatively inclusive. So, it, you know, a history department is supposed to teach about all of history, not just the 15th and 19th centuries. A geography department is supposed to teach about all of the Earth's surface, not just South America and Australia. A medical school teaches about all of the human body, not just arms and toes. But business schools, they just teach about one form of organisation. And that, it seems to me, is profoundly dangerous. It's, it's effectively a way of saying that all of these other organisational forms are somehow irrelevant or archaic or inefficient or whatever. And the only way that business can be conducted is the way that we tell you at the business school. Now, I think this is an intellectually very dangerous thing, obviously, given my interest in, in you know, carbon reduction and democracy and so on. But it's also quite a bizarre strategy, because in lots of disciplines, 
we'd assume that variety was the most important aspect of an intellectual understanding of that area. This is um, a little bit from the opening uh, uh, preface of the Royal Horticultural Society's Gardeners Encyclopedia of Plants and Flowers, which is a lovely illustrated book, which has loads of different kinds of plants in it, you know, big plants and small plants and plants that can survive in salty areas and rocky areas and that can live very high up or whatever, I don't know. Plants that are adapted to every different kind of circumstance. No, nobody teaching this kind of ecology would, would assume somehow that you should miss out areas of plants, that you shouldn't teach about fungus, or you shouldn't teach about flowers or trees or, or, or marshy plants or something like that. Because in order to understand the phenomenon of plants, it's not very, not very grammatical, but in order to understand plants, you need to understand all the various ways in which plants have adapted to their environment. So the basis of this particular discipline is variety, difference, pluralism. It's, it's a form of, um, uh, if you like, treating the object with the complexity that it deserves. Now, it's that that I want the business school to do, or my school for organising to do, to effectively adopt a kind of pluralist or diverse economies approach towards its object of inquiry, rather than assuming that they're only interested in you know, large corporations, that Amazon is the best organization that we could possibly imagine and so on, and to teach an experimental and alternative curriculum. Now, about um, uh, 15 years ago, I, um, together with some friends, edited um, what we called the Dictionary of Alternatives. This was a sort of an attempt to, if you like, put management in its place. And what we were doing was, was trying to explore this idea that organising and organisation are various and widespread and complicated and, uh, and, and, and inspiring in lots of ways. So the Dictionary of Alternatives, the subtitle was Utopianism and Organisation, contained entries on co-ops, on local exchange trading systems, on city-states, but also on different sorts of utopias, on organised crime, on terrorism, on different kinds of environmentalism and intentional communities, all sorts of different ways in which people had organised themselves. We produced um, a quarter of a million words um, with, I can't remember how many entries it was now, it was you know, sort of three, four hundred, four, three or four hundred entries, I think. And the idea was that we were, you know, we wanted this kind of rich book, rich book that allowed people to kind of, to explore the complexities of thinking about organization in these ways. When we gave it to the publishers, Z Books, they said that it was much, much too big to publish and that we needed to cut lots of it out. So I spent uh, one summer chopping out 125,000 words from the dictionary in order to get down to this, which is the table of contents. And you probably can't see it on that dense little slide, but somewhere in there is an entry on management. Because management is a form of organisation too. It's just not the only one. There's lots of others that don't assume hierarchy or information asymmetry, the dominance of a particular class of organizers and so on. So in a sense, the whole point of the dictionary was to kind of to make to make management small rather than making it dominant. Right, moving towards a conclusion. So what I am arguing for is here what I'm calling the school for organizing. This is a school which is appropriate to the challenges that face us rather than simply rehearsing what's worked for big corporations in the past. This will be a school that teaches about the possibility of a low carbon economy, about localized supply chains, about organizations that are collectively and democratically owned and controlled, an economy in which small is beautiful and responsibility to people and planet is the means and end of business. Now, it seems to me that that's, you know, that's not just idealism, that's what we have to do. That's, you know, I don't want you to kind of think of me as some kind of um, uh, patchouli smelling hippie, you know, imagining another world. If we want to teach people about a new economy, this is the kind of education we're going to have to give them, not the sort of education they're currently getting from the 13,000 business schools on the planet. Final point, which is to say that I think 
theoretically, effectively, what I'm saying here is that organizing is, to use a phrase from the social theorist Bruno Latour, politics made durable. When you construct a form of organization, effectively, you are embedding certain ideas about value, about who matters and what matters and what sorts of rewards and um, benefits should accrue to different, kind of different categories of people. So I want us to see organizing as political, not to simply think of it as a matter of resource efficiency or something along those lines, but to understand it as a political question and one that we should address in political ways because the problems that face us are political ones. You know, they're ones that require political solutions. And I think if we do that, then um, we will get not only, uh, hopefully, a chance of dealing with some of the crises that face us, but also a proper academic discipline and not just a finishing school for capitalism. Thank you very much for listening. I'll stop sharing and now you can all start to start shouting at me. <laughs> Okay. I think you're still muted, Andres. Hi, Martin. Hi. <laughs> Hello, Gordon. <laughs> That's excellent. Well done, uh, Martin. Thank you very much for very well, very thought-provoking and quite contentious. Uh, so that was the idea. So I'm I'm sure that I'm, I've looked at the chat room already, and there are quite a few things going on there already. Uh, but obviously, please. Uh, feel free all now to unmute yourself and to show your uh, video uh, so we can go to the Q&A session. It's very interesting for me because I went both to the Cranfield School of Management and to INSEAD in France. So okay. I think your perspective on business schools is, is quite interesting uh, <laughs> because certainly uh, when I was at <laughs> in both institutions, uh, it is definitely the very traditional business school in terms of maximizing profits, maximizing shareholder value, et cetera, et cetera maximizing market share. So I think there's going to be loads of questions. Uh, mm -hmm. Without going directly to the um, the chat room, why don't we start with those people who already unmuted themselves and got their video on? Does anybody want to ask a first question? Yeah. Ah, Gordon, you got there first. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Gordon. Lovely Hi. to see you. Um, I think I said in an email, Martin, that I agreed with 97%. Uh, yeah. So let's just look at the 3%. Okay, now that's fine. Because <laughs> <laughs> I agree with everything you said about organising and the alternative mm. ways of organising. The only thing is that I, I feel that there is an omission uh, behind what, what your case is, because politics go left right and all this sort of thing and eventually the economic theory that is dominant in the background which justifies a hell of a lot of these activities and people that uh, business schools have been taken over by mm. predominate and neoclassical economics as amended by Friedman and people like that still dominate business schools and even if we have a period of democracy and left-wing politics they will still be there unless we get rid of it because it's absolute bloody nonsense mm. so your main your main complaint and and this has been a consistent one for ever since i've known you hasn't it is about a particular neoclassical neoliberal version of economics that somebody dominates. was just mentioning profit maximization you know what the hell's profit maximization you mentioned shareholder wealth maximizing mm -hmm. you know this is all based on economics if the economic bullshit was removed or ignored in some way there would be no foundation for that kind of rubbish and the organizing that you're talking about would not be challenged by that kind of stuff and as we're cruising closer to climate crisis driven by this rubbish um it becomes ever more urgent and we mm. got to do it that was the only thing that the the three percent which i didn't feel that you um that i'd sufficiently addressed let <laughs> me just say i i i 
you know, I, I, you know, I broadly agree with you, but at the same time, I do think there are good economists. I think, I think the dominance. <laughs> there of are, the, yeah, there are a lot get... of economists who challenge it. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm very keen on those kinds of economists who think about different conceptions of value. It's just Absolutely. that I think I think we probably agree that the kind of the takeover of the business school by say what we might as well call kind of Chicago school economics. Sure. So it's, it's essentially, you know, the idea of. Um, uh, homo economicus about you know all our values being oriented to a certain kind of profit profit maximization has been toxic but it is it is the dominant model but when yeah. when um you know i was talking about the history of business schools and obviously as as, as, you, as you're well aware many of those histories talk about the way in which finance becomes the dominant discipline in u.s yeah. business schools in the 1970s um and that, and that, you know, I suppose that's the moment at which Chicago School, you know, rational choice economics effectively becomes the dominant mode. Yeah. Okay. So yes, I I, I agree that's with good. you one hundred percent, Gordon. I think I think you've just both agreed on the three percent you didn't agree on, which is which is great. <laughs> and you could argue, what does it do with a business school anyway? So I think you know this is the kind of uh, discussion. Uh, going to the next question now, uh, Tony. Can I talk about the 80% I think you left out of this discussion, <laughs> which yeah. is the customer. Okay. The purpose of a business is to satisfy customers. The reason Bezos is richer than other people is he's satisfying. He started with a few people he, he served in Seattle. Now he serves a third of the world and he is competing against other people who would gladly take his lunch. But he satisfies customers better than anyone else. Toyota started this way back when. Focus on the customer. Yeah. These business schools are not to produce people who get wealthy. They're to produce people who will organize themselves in a way that satisfies customers. Otherwise, there is no business. Without customers, you have no business. You've never mentioned the customer in all of this. Okay, this is your chance. M M Martin, this is your chance to address the customer in all of this. because uh, yeah. 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 It, it, it was evident in the slides. You know, I could see customers and cooperatives and, and uh, working together, et cetera. So I think it'd be mm. useful to sort of expand on that because obviously Tony definitely uh, didn't get that as part of the presentation. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'd need to ask you a little more, Tony, I guess, about why you think the customer matters quite as much as they do, because it seems to me that, you know, if we take Amazon as the example, that uh, that's a form of organization which is causing all sorts of problems. So in the name of customer satisfaction, we're destroying high streets, uh, we're losing taxation, we are no, encouraging no, a non-union no. employer you're to dominate the labour market. Tony, 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 uh, I'm just going to let, let uh, Martin finish and then we have a sort of proper dialogue rather than a sort of monologue. Go ahead. Go ahead. Over to you, Martin. Yeah, sure. I mean, my, my point is that the, the, the fetish of the customer is, is not the only way in which we can think about business. So I think you know, if, if we if we simply imagine that what customers want is the only criteria on which we are going to be constructing successful businesses, then we're doomed. You know, we we're, we're going to be living. We're going to be effectively we're going to be an extinct species. We have to base our economy on other other senses of value rather than simply what people want right now. Otherwise, we're going to be drowning in consumer goods. You know, the critique of consumerism isn't one that's unique to me. It's one that has been developed really since, well, since William Morris, I guess, something like 170, 180 years ago. So no, I don't, I don't, I don't think that simply satisfying customers is the purpose of economy. Well, I think, I think the, the, the interesting thing there is- <laughs> Just a minute. Just Tony, a minute. We'll, yeah. Tony, we'll come back to you. I just want to, uh, want to interject very quickly, Tony. And that is to say, maybe uh, we need to explore the difference between customer wants and customer needs, I think. In mm -hmm. well, <laughs> Or you can demonstrate what customers both want and need. They go to Mr. Bezos's Amazon before they go to Morrison's or go to, to Debenham's and all that. That is constructive destruction. That is magnificent. Somebody has served, has learned to serve customers cheaper, better and faster with higher quality. And that's where they've all gone. And so you think it's terrible that the high street is destroyed. The high street is nothing sacred. It will come and go as it satisfies customers or doesn't. So I, I think I, I, I'm amazed. Okay, now that, Tony, thank you for that. And uh, I think the idea of creative destruction, the, the Schumpeter principle is quite interesting. So over to you, Martin. Me to answer that? Yeah. 
Oh, right. OK. Yeah. I mean, I, um, <laughs> yes, I think I, I suspect that I and Tony have some very fundamental disagreements about what we think the purpose of an economy might be. Uh, my uh, quick rejoinder would be, well, as, as, I, as I've kind of indicated, I think if, if all we do in an economy is to celebrate um, celebrate uh, uh, organizations that are engaged in creative destruction, then we're going to destroy our planet. Um, you know, it's a pretty simple thing. And so we need to think about basing economies on different senses of value. Otherwise, we're doomed. No, I, I love this because I think the hands are going up everywhere. So I think uh, this, is, this is a really good multilog. I think uh, Trevor first and then we're coming back to Gordon and then we'll get into the chat room. Trevor. Uh, thank you. I'd love to take up the question about customers again, but I won't directly. But my question is about customers mm. because what's wrong with business schools is that the real customer for business schools is not the people who are getting the MBA, it's the people who are going to use those people. And the, quite honestly, the customer, the businesses, don't want what's coming out of business schools. There were, I can only refer you back to an article in Fortune magazine in 2007, which is titled The Trouble with MBAs, which mm. was the repeat of an article that happened 13 years before that. Only in this article, they did quote Jack Welsh from his mm -hmm. uh, talk to the Sloan Management School in 2015, when one of the students asked him, what should, we, what should we be learning in business school? And Jack Welsh said, just concentrate on networking. Everything else you need to know, you can learn on the job. And what Fortune did was to look at what for, the Fortune 500 companies said, what do you want from an MBA? They said, communication skills, working with others, written and oral presentations, and managing people, and nothing about the Chicago Management School of Economics or anything else. That's been known for a long time. Do you see any progress in that? Because the people who are teaching in business schools are academics. And I put a comment on the chat room. Can you imagine surgery being taught by someone who's never performed an operation? And most of the people teaching have never been in business. They know nothing about the real world. And when it comes to things like environment and things, even more removed. That's why business schools are not doing a good job and have not been doing a good job for a long time. Mm. Was that a statement yeah. or a question? Sorry. <laughs> I don't know, but I can certainly respond to it. But I think it, it's fair to say that the critique of business schools is uh, has been there for an awfully long time. You know, some of the early reports into business schools in the States, the Carnegie and the Ford reports in the 1940s, 1950s, made very similar comments. It doesn't seem to have stopped students from wanting to go to those schools. And again, you know, I point, point you to the, the, the global figure now, you know, the UNESCO figure, as I said, there's something like one in four students in higher education globally studying some variant of business and management. So whatever they're doing, they appear to be doing something that students want them to do, or at least believing a story that students uh, appear to want to believe. I think in practice, what's happening is the vast majority of people who are going to those schools don't end up as heroic entrepreneurial leaders or any of this kind of stuff. They're not doing Jack Welsh or Jeff Bezos. They are simply functionaries in large organizations. Yeah, so effectively, um, you know, business school degree doesn't make you into a doesn't make you into a leader or some kind of entrepreneur. It just makes you into a um, well, what uh, what uh, William White called an organization man. Apologies for the sexism in that. So, I, so I guess that they're playing the role of kind of staffing large corporations and businesses. That's effectively what their what what their purpose is: teaching obedience, if you like. Okay. Thank you, Martin. Uh, there's other hands going up. I think uh, Gordon had his hand up first, and then we go to Phil, and then we go to Digger. Okay. Uh, just a very short point about uh, the customer. The customer has to be paramount for the business, as Tony was saying, but the overall effect, if we leave that, for the economy <laughs> is disastrous. We have to intervene when people like Jeff Bezos and uh, Amazon, et cetera, et cetera, become monopolistic and exploitative in, in their activities. That was the only point I was making. The customer is paramount for the individual business, but not for the, for the economic economy as a whole. It's a helpful distinction, yeah. yeah. Thank you. yeah. Uh, over to Phil. 
and then we go to Diga, and then Duncan has got his hand up as well. So, Phil, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Andres. <clears throat> uh, thank you for that talk. Obviously contentious, as we've seen already. Um, I, worked the for, I, I worked for about six or eight years in a business school, one of the lesser ones in Britain. And one of the reasons I left was I felt that the business schools were becoming largely a, a business in and of themselves. They support the rest of the university in terms of the fees yeah. that come in. And this isn't a question, this is an observation, but one of the things I really objected to was undergraduate business degrees. And you actually have the situation now where you could have three, a two-year equivalent uh, A-level BTEC, have the same curriculum as an undergraduate student, mm. essentially the same curriculum as an MBA student or MSc in business, and you've actually learned nothing more than you did when you were 18 years old, which is a bit of a tragedy. Yeah. But anyway... So if, if we imagine that one could, um, at the click of a finger, create the business school that you want mm. and start to produce graduates with this different understanding of organizing, would, would they become an effective change agent for some mm. of these really important issues when they're merely being fed into a machine mm. which they would have no chance of changing? Yeah, yeah I mean, it's a great question, Phil. I mean, there's a sense in which um, I think you and I probably share quite a lot of similar pain. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, I don't want to be suggesting that business schools are the fulcrum upon which the world can be changed. That would be kind of foolish, I think. Um, I think business schools matter. It would be foolish not to, um, if you know, we care about the future of the economy and the planet and so on, not to be concentrating on this particular form of education. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's plenty of reasons why we need to change the, uh, the ways that we conceive of business in general. And I think, you know, there are a whole series of, of, of suggestions that I might want to be making here, but certainly one of them would be a fairly unconventional sort of Schumacher thing about, you know, cutting businesses down to size. I think that many of the large corporations, and this has been effectively recognized since the 19, 1920s again, hasn't it? Really do, and they're now so large, so dominant, the, the idea of them being controlled by democratic nation states is, 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 is kind of, well, it's just not feasible in a, in, in, in a way. So I think we need to cut business down to size in order to make sure that it doesn't, um, that those corporations don't effectively make their interests um, uh, somehow rather more important than the interests of humanity as a whole. Okay, thank you for that, Martin. I mean, I think the interest, uh, interesting thing here is about whether we see business as a machine or as an organism. I think I gave a talk a few mm -hmm. months ago about uh, the difference between the two. And I think uh, uh, clearly uh, business schools, uh, if they're teaching neoclassical economics and also uh, business, uh, business objectives like profit maximization, shareholder value and market share, etc., mm -hmm. uh, they, they treat... They treat their own organizations more as a machine that produces results rather than as an interacting organism. So I think that's interesting in itself. But over to Digger next. Hello, Digger. Oh, hello, Martin. Martin, I'm really, really interested in what you've been saying. I am I'm an alumnus of London Business School. But <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> no, no, no. Let me tell you why. Yeah. Uh, I did my first degree in engineering and my PhD in ocean wave analysis. I found myself running a successful business and I knew nothing about business. By year three, I'd made enough profits to tell my board that I was going to London Business School and they were going to pay. <laughs> so I learned from London Business School about the map that I had no idea existed mm. about how businesses were run. I then went back and carried on in that in my own business and, and, and made a success of it. So I'm not unhappy with what was offered to me mm. because it was a map of the blank areas of the ocean that had just leaping animals in them. And, okay, there'd be and dragons. It, it allowed me to walk with confidence into many, many boardrooms and simply say, no, this is the way I'm going to talk to you about this. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that what I learned at business school 
is a model for the future for all the reasons that you've put out. But I don't think that you will find an easy way of changing existing business schools when they have a very profitable model yep. to, to moving to your position. So why don't you just go completely radical and start a new business school that <laughs> only uses what you believe in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd love to. I mean, that's a tremendous provocation. To get. And, you know, I've talked to a couple of people about this and how we might do it and so on. Um, uh, perhaps we should discuss this more. I, I need, I need, a, I need a wealthy millionaire to help me with this because you know <laughs> there would be costs. But, but just going. There back... are lots. There are lots of wealthy millionaires around, as you mm. pointed out in what, your slide number fourteen. Yeah, and I think yeah. whatever it was. <laughs> and just to put Martin right, Jeff Bezos's uh, uh, income or wealth yeah. isn't uh, twenty billion. It happens to be one hundred seventy-nine billion at the last count. So, okay, I'm right. Sure, <laughs> I'm sure a million or two won't go amiss. Yeah, he's, he's probably yeah. Okay, so that's Jeff, Jeff Jeff Bezos to pay for my business school. That would be nice. I yeah. guess. I mean, just 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 pointing to the to, to you know to the sort of the, the the agreement I guess between myself and Digger. I mean, it's, it, you know, great that you had a really positive experience at LBS and 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 so on. And and you know, I, I I'm not saying that certain people don't get something from business schools. That would be a bizarre claim. I think. I guess what I what I want to suggest is that the sort of model of business and economy which is being taught at most current business schools will not serve us well in future and i think that's exactly right the key problem at the moment is that business schools particularly in the uk are effectively bankrolling a marketized higher education system um, the changes that have happened in terms of state funding to uk universities really since the kind of late 1980s early 1990s um, have been underwritten by the expansion of certain key disciplines, particularly law, psychology and the business school. And the business school is the biggest cash machine of all because that provides the unencumbered income very often, um, as, as I'm sure you all know, by by selling extraordinarily expensive master's degrees to Chinese students. So it's effectively that that's locking in a particular kind of business school system right now. If I could just use, use the example of Bristol, um, uh, the, the moment the University of Bristol has been the only, um, uh, you know, probably the only university, certainly the only Russell Group University without a business school. It's just about to start one now. And it's pretty explicit that the point of starting it is to make enough money to keep the chemistry department open. You know, that's that's what it's there for, not for some kind of, you know, profound intellectual project or exploration of organising, but to make make money to make sure that the university can keep its top 50 position. A business school that makes money. Whatever they, uh, <laughs> they all do. They, can I, can Diga, I just Diga, can I Diga, respond Diga, to Martin? Diga, I know you want to come back, but I've, I've got a couple of other questions. We'll come back to you in a bit. Well, just, Diga, okay? Can I just respond mm. directly? I'm just asking him to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. But but to actually do what he's talking about. Yeah. Mm. We're all, okay, yeah. Diga, we'll all put our hands in our <laughs> and support Martin with yeah. a couple of hundred pounds and see where we get to. <laughs> uh, right. Over Thanks, Digger. Over to Duncan. Uh, yes, I um, did an MBA many, many years ago. and um, I did it really just to get another qualification and didn't think it would be particularly useful. And then I found out that it was. And I probably, I think, um, I missed the hidden agenda that actually it was, you know, Martin seems to be suggesting that I, that I was supposedly being taught a particular way of looking at at business. Now, mm. I looked at it and very much what they were trying to turn out were generalists. Um, when you showed that thing about, you know, from the RHS, mm. you know, there are huge numbers of plants, so you can't possibly cover orchids. What you're trying to do is actually have enough of an overall view that you can go and talk to one type of specialist or another type of specialist and so on. And I found the stuff that I learned, you know, to do with accounting or financial modelling, I actually was able then to go and talk to experts in the firm I worked for, and so I could understand what they were getting at. And what I, what I was actually mainly doing was developing financial modelling systems, which is, which is what we sold, um, amongst other, other things. And, but it was the fact that all these sort of various techniques, if you like, um, 
that didn't have a sort of hidden agenda. You know, if, if you're you know, dealing with this sort of problem, then here's a way of looking at it. And if you're dealing with that sort of problem, then here's a sort of framework. Mm -hmm. And I found those surprisingly useful, but I didn't come out thinking, oh, uh, it's all to do with um, growing big big businesses and it's all corporate. Um, not at all. I just, just found that I could actually, no, I was given problems to do with, here we are trying to, to, to do these pensions calculations, but um, uh, but it's taken an awful long, long time. And you think, oh, we've seen a problem like that at, um, in one of the case studies we did. And mm. I actually, actually then had a, like a framework. We're going to say, well, you're trying to do this to make it cheap, but actually what you want it to be is quick. And therefore, rather than do it in a batch way, you want to do it in a, um, a jobbing way, having these, these terms. And okay. that sort of problem, as well as the financial yeah. modeling problem, I found I was then able to solve, but I didn't have a sort of, oh, well, um, the way that um, giant corporations yeah. work mm. is, is what yeah. we should all be aiming at. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it'd be interesting. I mean, I, I, I guess, I mean, sort of two, two, two comments, I suppose. I mean, I, th I think that you're, the way that you described your engagement with the business school sounds very much like the way I would want students to learn from my school for organising. So, you know, that sounds great in terms of producing a particular kind of generalist. But did they teach you about co-ops at your business school? No, I mean, one of the subjects was um, small business man management, because I, I know I did that as one of my options, mm. so I thought I wanted to come out of this at least able to run a whelk stall. Um, <laughs> so, you know, they didn't particularly talk about um, mm. co-ops um, as far as I can remember, but there was nothing to say that a co-op would be wrong, whereas um, a, a corporation is right. Mm. So the stuff we would learnt in um, small business management would have, been re would have been applicable to that sort of thing, but there are just too many things to to go into the details when you're trying to come out as a generalist. Mm, yeah, I think, I mean, it, I like the idea of, of kind of generalist. I mean, it kind of fits with, so, you know, the, the, the author Henry Mintzberg. He has this, this rather, he's a, a, a Canadian management academic um, who's, who's, who's quite critical of business schools um, and talks about this idea of managers. I mean, I think the title of one of his books is, is Managers, Not MBAs, and likes to think about management as a kind of a practical activity, which is engaged in by generalists, yeah, rather than MBAs, which he sees to be a kind of narrow, technocratic, elitist and arrogant sort of way of thinking about, about what management is. So if we can cult cultivate those kinds of generalists in my new school, fantastic. I don't think that's what the pitch of most business schools most of the time. I think, they're, I think they are teaching a very narrow range of organisational possibilities and a particular version of, of the kind of, of managerial privilege, if you like. Maybe I went uh, long enough ago that it was before business schools went bad. Are you it looking may, for crowd, been, yeah, are you looking for crowd maybe, funding? Maybe, Duncan. Let's, yes, let's, please. Let's move, let's move on as well, though, because I think the, the, the key thing is uh, really, and I suppose for Martin, is to consider this, what is the, the purpose of a business school in mm. society? You know, and I think what Duncan described has given him some useful tips and information in terms of how he conducts his life in a business. Mm. Uh, whereas uh, I think what, what we've discussed so far is that if a business school purpose is to provide somebody with a piece of paper that says MBA uh, to go into the business world, is, is that sufficient? Or do they have, or should the person have uh, a wealth of information, knowledge and experience in terms of becoming a future business leader? Question mark. That's a rhetorical question, Martin, mm. which you do not need to answer. I just want to get other people in. <laughs> We sure. haven't had a chance yet. Uh, Anna, you've been very quiet. I, I know that you're chip, chipping in into into Martin's fund. Thank you, Anna. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the money. Do you do you want do you want to raise your question comments or should I go to uh, George's comment, who's actually just left? Uh, because uh, Anna, do you want to do your comment first? Um, I can't remember what my comment was. I'm afraid. I I think I was responding to George. Um, when he's, he's, he was challenging Martin on his um, lack of knowledge of, of um, Chernobyl and the, the RLC, that oh, is okay. the environmental disaster, and saying you know any kind of economic uh, organization that we've had in the past and still have has been responsible for total disasters. No, why point the finger at, at uh, uh, 
uh, capitalism. And mm. I answered to him, but I answered privately that I was sure that, um, no, actually, I answered to everybody, you know, socialism is not being peddled as a viable economic and social yeah. organization in most business schools, as far as I know. And then we carried on the, um, the discussion privately, I'm afraid. No, I, I'm afraid I'm, I'm one of the very few here who totally 100% agrees with Martin, I think. There you go. I wish I, wish I was younger and I would join your course. There you, <laughs> Excellent. Go. Good. Well, there you go. She's well done. I think the, Thanks, only, thing I, the only thing I would say uh, to that, Anna, is that uh, uh, the point George makes, I personally believe is actually a valid one. And that is that uh, in order to look at the business school of the future, uh, it is not it is not helpful just to look at existing different economic systems mm. yeah so i think you know uh, a business school can equally be as badly run with as little focus in terms of what the future business needs of the planets are in socialism communism and capitalism and and therefore focusing on one of them is always going to be more difficult because it will antagonize the dominant narrative, which is capitalism in the West, and therefore will be discounted straight away. And in order to sort of find a way forward, I think it really is important to actually define the purpose and aims of business schools and the, and the role that we want these people who graduate from them to play in society. Mm. That is important rather than concentrating on the economic system. Mm. Self. Yeah, kind of. Can I can I just respond to that a bit? And that's sorry, I was just reading George's some of George's comments in the chat as well. I mean, I, you know, I don't want to come across as if I am a socialist or a communist. I think there are socialist or communist solutions to particular kinds of problems, and there are certain areas of the economy where we might might agree that public control is quite a good idea. But I'm not suggesting for a second that everything should be owned by the state. You know, that that we should be moving towards that kind of centralized command economy. That clearly hasn't worked terribly well in the past. So, you know, I'm very, I'm very enthusiastic about small businesses and about uh, shortened supply chains and about the, the idea of a kind of diverse range of businesses. What I'm worried about is the dominance of uh, a relatively small number of extraordinarily rapacious corporations that appear not to have my best interests at heart. Yeah. So the only thing is, let me just read a question from Bob or a comment, really, before we get back uh -huh. to Gordon. And Bob asks, uh, how does the uh, business school idea that biggest beautiful square with the success of investment funds are based on small businesses and the long standing success of the German Mittelstand, the middling companies? Yeah. So I, think, yeah. I think what he's saying is look, uh, a lot of business school focus isn't just about the, uh, the, the Amazons and, and Apples of this world, it's mm. actually also about how do you actually run and create a successful business that is properly funded uh, through investments, etc., at, at a much lower level. So, you know, SME and, and probably middle. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, the, the, the story of business schools in, in Germany is, is quite interesting because um, it doesn't really fit the dominant narrative terribly well. And indeed, you can argue that uh, German business schools have been much more focused on a more kind of pragmatic practical version of what it might mean to get certain kinds of technical skills rather than being beguiled by the kind of neoliberalism that was peddled by the Chicago boys so yeah I mean I think there is something interesting in that yeah. if, if we're going to push this further then we'd have to say capitalism isn't one thing there are and this is you know a, a fairly well-worn uh, set of ideas now there are different ways in which capitalism operates and they can be more or less benign the usual, usual example given is kind of Nordic capitalism, if you like, where in which you have relatively high levels of taxation, good social safety net and all that kind of stuff. And very often, say, you know, in the German example, for example, but Nordic as well, uh, levels of co-determination in which workers are you know, heavily involved in uh, consultations about the future of the organisation and so on. That's quite alien to the more Anglo tradition, I think. Um, and, 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 you know, maybe in a sense, my complaint is more about the kind of the British American business school than it might be about German versions of business education, which don't really look like that very much. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're coming up to the watershed in, in five minutes. Oh, five oh wow. Minutes. Yeah. We've got five minutes. It's been a nonstop discussion. I think Gordon, Gordon uh, had another question, did you, or comment? <laughs> I was just going to uh, make a broad comment about... Um, business business schools and the the sort of focus of business schools being on business as opposed to the economy as a whole and 
the whole environmental stuff and how things can be mm. all integrated as a system, but rejecting all the single isms, you know, capitalism, socialism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, we need to focus on what works and we need to understand what works. That was really all I was going to say. Mm. Can, it's I, can, I talk, can I talk about the paradox of the customer for, for a moment? The mm. only way I say you will solve the climate change problem is for governments to become dissatisfiers of customers. Industry is trying to satisfy them. Customers are going to, governments are going to say you can only travel once a year. You've got to eat local food, <laughs> travel on mm. public transport, mm. no cars, go back to the 14th century. That kind of living will solve, <clears throat> solve climate change. That's going to be very interesting to see mm. who's the big winner in all of that. I think... I yeah, I think I think that's a great point, Tony, and you're pointing to one of the real political difficulties in terms of kind of re-engineering the economy. Yeah, exactly. uh, because, yeah, I mean, very often um, versions of a greener economy look like hair shirt politics, don't they? You know, we're not going to let you do the kinds of things that you're going to do that we, you want to do. But nonetheless, it somehow has to happen. You know, we simply can't carry on spewing out carbon in the way that we are. Yeah, I think uh, I can... I'll challenge that in another the yeah, next yeah. speech, next time you come. Well, <laughs> you, can, you can challenge me probably in August because I'm going to be talking about lessons learned from COVID and in, in terms okay. of. Okay. So I think we, 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 this will feature. But I think uh, uh, just to close it off, I suppose, mm. one of the things that uh, we need to understand is that uh, whether it is uh, business uh, logic, whether it is economic theory, uh, it only touches a very small part of actually how we lead our lives. And, uh, you know, for economics or business to talk about externalities, so all everything that it sees as external to itself is because it sees no responsibility for these things. And therefore, these are the kind of things we need to change. If you run a business, if you run an economy, you are responsible for all the aspects of that, not just in terms of what you produce, but also the impacts and the consequences that creates. I think that's a fair, that's a that's a fair way of doing it. This is all the the whole point of freedom is is freedom from and freedom to. At the moment, we concentrate on freedom to do whatever we like, but not actually freedom from being being the recipient of some of the externalities and some of the problems that it causes. So I think we close it at the, on that juncture. Uh, it would be really nice because most people are still uh, unmuted to give Martin a big round of applause for a very challenging and very interesting presentation. So thank you very much. Thanks ever so much. Thank you. Thank you. You're a great, a great and very provocative audience. And, and Gordon, Jude sends her love. Sorry? Jude sends her love. <laughs> Jude sends Brilliant, a, thank you. Jude sends a laugh. That's a nice way to finish. I'm just going to finish very quickly and let you know that normally August is a fallow period uh, for the BLSI, so we're not uh, having many lectures there. I'm. I might put actually. I might actually give a lecture, as I said, on on uh, uh, the lessons learned, business lessons learned from COVID. Uh, in August. I'll keep you posted. If not, it will be in September. The other thing I wanted to mention is, as you know, uh, the government has is relaxing all the uh, restrictions for COVID uh, from the 19th of July, which does mean that uh, live lectures uh, will be returning to the BLSI uh, from the 19th of July. Uh, but uh, we are not going uh, to total relaxation. We, we have decided the BLSI we will still be running at 50% capacity for the rooms. We will still have live lectures, but also run them on Zoom concurrently. So you can be a live member in the audience, but you can also be a live member on Zoom watching the things. So it gives you a choice which way to watch it. And we will insist on face masks still being worn uh, during lectures because it's such a close proximity. So uh, that's what we've decided. So uh, please have a look at the website and see which talks you might be interested in. And uh, you can buy either a ticket to turn up in person or you can pick up a ticket uh, to, to join via Zoom. I hope that uh, gives you the best of both worlds. So without further ado, uh, I hope I hope the relaxation of COVID goes well, uh, starting uh, from the 19th. Uh, but as I always end this, uh, these meetings is stay healthy, stay safe, and most importantly, 
stay sane. Bye bye. Cheers. Thank you very much, everybody. Very much. Bye bye. 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 See you, Gordon.